Who, put your hands up if you have the assets. Okay, about half. Don't worry guys, there's like pen drives and stuff coming over, it's just started that side. Okay, cool. So whilst they're heading over, we're going to do something a little bit different with the crates. So we've created lots of crates. We've got to the stage where we are... The update loop is running. We're hitting C. And if statement says if we hit C or if we hit whatever, it's going to create a crate. It's going to be red and it spawns at that point. And if you spawn loads, they're all going to sort of pop because all these physics are then happening. It's like putting a putting a, one of those candles inside another candle at the same time. It's going to mix and merge and then the physics basically push it out because it's forcing against each other. So what we're going to do is we're going to randomize something. We're basically going to say to each crate, because we've stored each crate into a variable of created crates, like temporarily until the next time the loop comes around, we're then going to do something with that. We're going to access it. And we're going to do a thing which I call leapfrogging. So leapfrogging is basically a way of drilling down the layers on an object and its components to access a particular thing and change it. So if we look at, for example, directional light, what we can do is any of these properties here, so for example, the type of light, the range of the light, the intensity, the color, these things, can all be accessed via the API of Unity and changed in runtime. So for example, this light is currently white. If I wanted, for example, at a certain point in the game, the light to fade to red, I can then go into the code and I can access the light, access the component of this object, access the color of that, and then change that color and lerp it over time to a particular thing. So any of these things here can be accessed on runtime and edited and tweaked and changed. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the same thing. We're going to leapfrog, and I'll show you why I'll call it leapfrogging in a sec, through the, through the object that's created, down to the renderer, to the material, to the color of the material, and then change that. So we're going to have five different colors, and basically each time a cube's created, it's going to pick one at random and then assign it to that material. So yeah, we're going to leapfrog through the layers, so it's cool. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create an array. So one way that you could do an array of four different colors, and this is the bad way, <laughs> is to write, for example, a separate variable for each and every single one of the, and so on, you get the drift. Basically, you're creating three variables, then you have to manage all these variables. You have to then, you know, position them, order them, and things like that. So if we then went into the Unity Editor after creating red, blue, and green, what you'll notice under the manager is we now have three color slots. Okay, if I saved it. Three color slots for us to change it to red, change it to blue, change it to green. But you know, that's, that's okay if we had like two or three colors like this, but what if we had 70, for example? You know, then you've got managed 70 variables, and they're not in a list, you can't randomly pick from one. It would be a nightmare to manage. So what you can do is we can basically use Unity's, uh, like the, the way variables are constructed in Unity's API, to create an array for this particular reference. So I'm going to get rid of all those colors. Sorry to those of you who just typed that out. And I'm going to write public color. Then instead of saying public color colors array, so doing that will basically give us one slot for a color. And similarly, if I did that for the transform, it would give us one slot for a transform, one integer, one float, and things like that. What we can do is if we had square brackets after the type of variable, so for example here, so it's now public color, square brackets, colors array, it's now going to create an array for that reference. So instead of colors array being one color, it's now going to be an array of colors that we can then pick. So if we then save that, go back into Unity, what you'll notice is that instead of having a drop-down area on the side here, there's a drop-down bit on the left. It's going to ask us, what's the size of the array? How many items do you have? So just set five, for example. We now have five elements inside that array. So you all know what an array is, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, cool. So we now have colors array, and we have five elements inside it, starting at zero and then going up. You could have an array of... 100 million, which is now going to crash Unity, and I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Noob mistake. Yeah, but you, you could basically have tons and tons and tons of items in the array. Right, I'll write all the code, and then I'll catch up with you guys, don't worry. So we've now got that array, and you can basically specify the colors. So in this case, specify four different colors, five different colors. Go into the color picker and pick which colors you want to use. 
So what we're going to do now is every time that we push a button and we create an object, we're going to pick a random number from that array. So we're going to say int random int equals, and we're going to use random.range. So random.range is basically going to pick a maximum and a minimum number and pick somewhere in between that range. So if we were to do as your geniuses, what, how would we write the random range, the minimum and maximum number to scale with the array? So say like if we change it from five colors to 700 colors, how would you set the minimum and maximum for that? Oh, pardon? Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the start value would be zero because it's an array. It begins at zero. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to set, for example, five in here. Then I pick a number between zero and five. And then, for example, I add then 70 more colors, 20 more enemies. So I'm going to have to go into the code, change that, go back, and so on and so forth. Even though it's one thing you have to change, it's still you know something that you can avoid. You have this public um, inspector which has all the variables and things vi set visually, so you should be able to you know not worry about it. So one thing you can do is instead of setting a maximum value, you can instead write colors array dot length. So what this will do is it will basically get the length of the array and pick a number between zero and whatever that length is. That length could be a hundred million, like I set foolishly. Um, but basically, it will pick a number between that. So we can add, go to the designer and say, pick as many colors to your heart content, and he can go wild, and he wouldn't need to go into the code and probably cause an error and change things and stuff like that. So we're now going to pick a number between those. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to go through the crate and do leapfrogging. So we're going to go to created crate dot renderer. So what we're doing here is we're basically, it's kind of like Inception, where they basically kept going through loads of jumps and leaps to get to a particular point. So for example, you've all seen Inception, right? Do you know what Inception is? The movie, yeah. The movie, yeah. So basically their end goal was to get to the, 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 the vault at the very end, on the very last level. So basically they had to leapfrog lots, through lots of dreams, and people who haven't seen Inception probably think, what the heck is he on about right now? But yeah, basically they're leapfrogging and narrowing down to get to this vault in the end. In this case, we're kind of doing the same thing. So we're referencing the object, in this case, create crate. We're then referencing what we want to access in that create a crate, in this case, the renderer. What, what are we going to do with the renderer? Do we want to turn it off? Do we want to set it to be, you know, something else, not render, things like that? We're going to go to material, because that's where we want to edit. When they're going to narrow down what we want to do about material. Do we want it to edit the texture? Do we want it to edit uh, the alpha value or something like that? In this case, we want to edit the color. Then here, we state what color we want it to go to. So we could do an RGB and basically pick the colors randomly on runtime, or we can use those ones from the editor. In this case, we're going to use the ones from the editor. So to do this, we just write colors array. Then inside, that, inside some square brackets, we're basically going to write down which element we want. So if we want the second color of the colors array, we then do that. In this case, we're going to get random int and do that. So we're going to create a create dot renderer dot material dot color. What do we want to do with that color? We want to assign it to whatever color we picked here. Awesome. Cool. So if you now run it, every time you create a crate, what should happen is, um, hang on, I don't have mine. It should change colors each time. So you should have a volcano of rainbow stuff. Awesome. Big rainbows, yeah. <laughs> Cool, so as I'm copying the project across, is the, who, who's now got the assets, or is everyone kind of now making rainbows? Cool. So has everyone got stacks of pre pretty presents, like you said? Colourful presents being delivered. Awesome. So what we're going to do now is, so we've all got the assets. What I want you to do is to go to the assets and open up that zip. So where are my assets? Shouldn't take too long to open it up. And what I'm going to go through is basically a couple of bits and pieces inside that zip. So you've got the presentation that I'm using in the background, um, and you've also got a whole bunch of training resources. So in the training resources sub 3D models folder, you should have a toast folder, and inside there we have an FBX of a piece of toast and a very nice toast with the Unity logo burnt into it. Cool. 
Audio-wise, we should have a fruit splat sound effect and a background track. Um, we should have the Unity font, which is Clavica, as well. Um, you should have a package called Fruits. Uh, you should have three textures, which are sprites. So in this case, it's like a running animation and jumping animation, things like that. Uh, Iron Man as well, it's pretty cool. And you can't see this one, but it's a white Unity logo. You should, might be able to see it on your screen a bit better. Um, and texture-wise, we've got a crate, which is great, I guess. So what we're going to do is we're going to import these into our Unity project. Before that, we need to manage all of these bits and pieces. So in this case, what we're going to do is, there's a couple of ways that you can import these things in. Really, this is the simplest way, is I'm just going to double click, I'm going to select all of these folders here. Now I could copy and paste them into the assets folder of Fruit Splat, or what I can do is I can just drag and drop them straight into Unity like so, let go. Audio takes a little while. And we should now have a lot of folders here. So we've got 3D models, 3D models 1. So, <laughs> so yeah, it's just the equivalent of saving it into that assets folder. You can just drag and drop it straight in, which and it'll also import all these things and read all the file types and stuff. Now we've got a lot of duplicates, so what I want you to do is go through the duplicates and just sort of keep the ones which have, not, which have stuff in. So for example, we have a 3D models folder which I made earlier on as an example, and we have one which has toast inside. Just delete the one which has nothing in. So basically, just go through and make sure all the folders are ones that actually have things in. Uh, fonts, materials, packages, prefabs, scenes, scripts, sprites. textures, and so on and so forth. So you should have a very neat and tidy project set up like so. Cool. Everyone awesome with that. So what I've done here is I've basically made a couple of uh, objects, downloaded a couple of objects, used a couple of objects, such as 3D models, textures, audio and things like that and we've literally just brought them into Unity like copy and paste them into Unity, dragged and dropped them into Unity and it's handled a lot of the importing for us however it's not as simple as just dragging these things and suddenly it's going to make a game for us we do have to do a little bit of management of objects and materials and textures and things like that in Unity so for example we're going to build a material out of this texture to then basically map onto the slice of toast and this will make sense in a sec so if we go into our scene, if we go into the 3D model section, you'll notice there's a little folder called Toast. If we open that up, there will be a couple of folders. So one will be uh, FBX, a 3D model of a piece of toast. And what you should see is if you select the FBX, which is like the little blue box with like a little white file underneath, basically it's going to show you a little preview of what that piece of toast looks like, what that particular mesh looks like. If you click the drop-down arrow next to that model, it will basically you'll be able to see what the actual mesh looks like of that model that was created in whatever program it was created in. Plus also, if it's an avatar, like it has a particular rig, so we're not going to do any rigging because it takes ages to do. Um, but if there is a rig that you'd made in Maya, for example, or some bone joints or things like that, it would then show, for example, that avatar rig. But in this case, it doesn't. It's just got a particular mesh of how the, te how the toast is shaped. So that's cool. So the other thing that we need to look at is the fact that there is a texture. So this is a toast slice text. So this is basically the texture we want to map onto that slice of toast. Now that slice of toast in the modeling program, like I think it was probably Maya, for example, what they've done is they've done, they've done all the UV mapping and bits and pieces like that. So a lot of people ask me, is Unity a 3D modeling program? And truthfully, it isn't. You can't go in, you can't have a box and then grab points, vertices of the box and move them around and then UV map and things like that. You can't do that sort of thing in Unity. It's more like a asset bring everything together and make a game type thing as opposed to 3D modeling in, in the editor. However, Unity does talk very well with other programs and it handles a lot of things like you bring in Maya binary files, Cinema 3D files, all these other things and it will recognize them all very fine. You don't have to do a lot of prep.
As a hobbyist, which uh, 3D modeling program should we recommend? Um, I. I've used Cinema 4D and Maya. I prefer Maya and they've or Maya. Maya free? No. 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 If you're a stu if you're a student, it's free. Like, uh, um, a they're doing. They've done. They've just released a Maya LT Lite version, just like a mega cheap version of Maya, but I'm not sure what's in it or how it works. And you also have Blender 3D. Which is pretty good. Or Blender, yeah. Okay. Um, That's free. It's free and open source. Yeah, and open source, yeah. I'll use that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, I just use Maya because I always use Maya, but the, I know people who do stuff in like uh, Modo or 3ds Max or all these other things. Although you can't get 3ds Max on a Mac, so I always have to run parallels if I want to use it. So, yeah. Cool. Um, pardon? <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. So we have our texture, and what you'll notice underneath materials in that little subfolder is we have a very blank, very boring DP shader. That's because every time a mesh gets brought into Unity from another program, it automatically adds a material onto it. I think it's partly so that it doesn't scare people that they bring their piece of toast and it looks pink, like I showed you earlier on. They automatically tag on a little material onto that. Now in Maya, what you can do is you create your object, you textured it, and so on and so forth. When you export it as an FBX, you can do embed media, and it will automatically attach the, the, for example, the toast texture onto the material, and you bring it to Unity. You don't have to reassign some bits and pieces. However, I think this wasn't made in Maya, so we have to do the, all the hard work, which is dragging and dropping one thing. So we've got our slice of toast. And what you'll notice here is we have a whole load of import settings. So whilst the object is brought in, we can drag and drop it into the scene. So for example, if we drag the slice of toast into the scene, we can then use it, it adds it into the hierarchy, and we then have this particular object with this particular model. There may be other things that we want to do. So for example, if we want to import any animations, we go to the animations tab and we'd be able to import those things in. So perhaps you don't want to animate in Unity, you want to animate instead in Maya or things like that, and do blend shape animation, deformers and things like that. Then what you do is you then import the animations there. Toast doesn't have any animation. Uh, it doesn't have a rig, so we can ignore that. The next one is the model. So the model will basically allows us to tweak various things. So for example, the normals of the model, so whether these faces are facing outwards or whether they're facing inwards, which way they're going. We can import the ones that are already set, or we can recalculate them. Um, we can import in materials. We can import in blend shapes, so if the model has a blend shape. Uh, we can generate light map UVs, optimize the auto optimize the mesh. You can do lots of other things, but one of the things you might need to play around is scale factor, because it's always set to 0.01, and the majority of time, these objects tend to be like, like that big. Like they normally come in very, very, very small and very tiny. So what we sometimes have to do is you basically have to play around with the scale factor and increase that up a bit. So if we look at the slice of toast, we might say, that's a little too small. Now, we could edit the scale properties here. What we can do is we can scale up the mesh directly and say, let's increase it by five times. Go down and click Apply. And basically, then it's going to make a massive slice of toast. That seems a little too overkill. So I'm going to drop it down to perhaps 0.02. Yeah, so we now have a little slice of toast. Cool. So if we select the slice of toast in our scene, you'll notice it's, it's pre-built up with a bunch of things. It's got a position, rotation, and scale, as any object would. It's got the mesh filter. It's got the renderer. It's got an animator, which it automatically attaches on. We don't have to worry about that too much. And we've got also the material, this little toast slice attached to it. So if we change the material of toast slice, so for example, to red, what you'll notice is it's changing the material wrapped around it. Now, what we want to do is we want to say, instead of it being red, or we can use red if we want, we want to use a texture. We want to apply a texture onto it. And that's very easy to do. So what we can do is, underneath this little none texture area, we can drag and drop a texture into it, or click select and pick which, we want, which one we want to use. So in this case, I want to use the toast. So if I select the toast, what you'll notice is that the material now has a little toast property onto it. Obviously, also it's red, so I'm going to change it back to white. What you can notice is that the texture is now wrapping around the object, and that texture is made to wrap around the object in the modeling program. 
So the majority of your programmers or developers as opposed to artists, you'll probably be given three models or things like that, already have three models which are UV mapped. Has anyone here done like UV texturing or UV mapping? Okay, it is very time consuming and painful at times. Uh, yeah, but it's a, lot of, it's a lot of fun. It depends what you're into. Cool. You now have a slice of toast, that's cool. So one thing you might not notice is it doesn't have a collider. Now, we can amend that in a couple of ways. So one way that we can do to this piece of toast is we can select it, go to Component, go to Physics, and give it a box collider. What you'll notice is that the blue mesh around it is basic. the blue uh, the lines is basically how the shape is formed, whereas the green lines is kind of what its collider is like, how it's going to interact with other things within the game. So when this falls and this drops, it's going to act exactly like a box or a book would, or things with a box collider. Now, even though that is very optimized because it's not got as much things to calculate, it may not be entirely accurate for you want. So for example, stairs in a game tend to be a ramp. So the collider is a ramp that the player walks up, but visually it's more like steps. So things like Mario 64, they weren't steps. You can sometimes see Mario's foot going through the floor and things like that because it's just a ramp because it took too much to work out a collider for every single step. However, I think now, later games now, you actually have properly steps, so that's completely defunct now because they can get away with it, I guess. Um, so we can use this box collider here. Now, if I didn't want to use that and I wanted to use, for example, a collider that wrapped around this mesh completely, what I can do is I can remove the box collider to get rid of it, select the, project, the toast in the project, so you have this list of things like import blend shapes, and there's one called generate colliders. So what this is going to do, it's going to get the mesh of the object and it's going to get a collider, which is almost like if I take this bottle and wrap it in cling film and take the bottle out, I've now got a cling film mold of that particular object, which I can then still use for its shape. So if I select generate colliders and click apply, what you'll notice is that the slice of toast has now got a mesh collider instead of a box collider in these things. It's using a mesh of toast slice. If I turn off the mesh renderer, well, you'll notice that we now have, rather than green box, we now have a collection of green lines making up the rack of our mesh. So it's basically saying, this is how it's going to, this is how it's going to collide with the objects. So what you'll notice here, inside this little crack of the um, toast, that will now fall. So, for example, if we have, for example, some form of corner, it will now be able to cut into that that little point. So, this is the generation. so if you select the toast slice in the project. Um, there should be, oh, I mean, uh, so it should be a little blue box with like a little white like document next to it. Bingo. So you go to select the toast, go to physics, component physics, rigid body. Do you notice that we're building up our objects again? We've added the collider, we've added the texture, we've added the rigid body and things like that. So now that we have this piece of toast, this 3D model imported in, <coughs> what you want to do is you want to save a prefab of it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to collapse down the 3D models folder, open up the prefabs folder, and I'm just going to drag and drop, because I was told off last time I didn't do this way, <laughs> um, drag and drop the toast slice into the prefabs folder. And what it should do is it should automatically make, in our project, a master copy of all the components and all the things about it. And we can now delete toast slice from our scene. Yeah, so if I, okay, so I've got three bits of toast. Or like that. So if I went to one of these pieces of toast, one of these instances of the toast, I can edit its properties, you know, independently and things like that. Because it's its own thing, it has its own behavior and its own properties. However, if I went to the master copy, the one inside here, and said, right, I want all of the pieces of toast to be three by three by three, that one should have changed. Okay, it did change, but I had to revert it. So yeah, basically changing the master copy, so for example, all of them are rotated 45 degrees around Y, it didn't want to do it. Yeah, so turning the mesh render on and off with the master copy basically goes down through all the other things. So if you make like one tree in your project, you place 500 of them. You don't have to go through every single tree and change all the colors and things. You can just go to the master copy, 
tweak that one and then it will apply it and go down to all the other like little instances and change all those things about it. And can you do that in runtime? Like by code, I mean? What, changing this project here? No. Uh, yeah, like changing the source slide but by coding. Uh, uh, yeah. From the script, it automatically apply to all the... Uh, yeah, so a couple of ways you could do that. I think accessing the item in the prefab saved here, I don't think you can, but what you can do is you can make a copy of that within your scene, and then that's your master copy of the master copy, and then edit that one, and then it will narrow down. Yeah. Or you can use a, a for each loop to basically find all the objects that are toast, and then change all their properties, and now cycle through them. Cool. So I'm going to change them back down small. We now have three bits of toast all with physics. So can anyone take a wild guess and you get a gold star for doing so, what we're going to do now? Pardon? Yeah, so cubes are kind of boring, so we're going to use toast instead. So now we have this cube slot. Remember, this isn't a preset. This isn't like defined as in a sense we must have cubes. We can only spawn cubes from this point. No other future cubes that can be used. What we can do is we can chop and change things how we want. So we're going to go to the toast slice prefab, <coughs> drag and drop it into the cube slot. So now, instead of creating cubes, we'll be creating lots and lots of toast. And they're not affecting each other. Weird. Pardon? Uh, it, it has too much coming. Why are all the toast on top of each other? Interesting. Uh, I've just done that. I've just no, no, rotated. No, no. I've just rotated the spawn. Well, that's happened when I put the animation. The problem is that for some reason it changes the depth from uh, zero to minus two. <laughs> Your demo also not working? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're not going to use the Toast Collider. Instead, we're going to turn Generate Colliders off and apply that. Then go to our Prefab Toast, and instead of using a Mesh Collider, we're going to add a Box Collider instead <coughs> and replace it. <coughs> so now our Toast that saved in it as a Prefab doesn't have Mesh Collider, now has a Box Collider around it. <coughs> Which isn't as accurate, but we now have breakfast. Cool, so has everyone else got very coloured toast? I'm a bit worried about the green toast. I wouldn't like green toast, but red is, I guess, jam or something. Is yours okay? Or? So one thing that might be quite, one thing that might be quite cool is to instead of on key down, it creates a slice of toast. So you have to keep mashing it over, and you have to keep hitting the button. Perhaps just get key because what get key would do is then constantly create lots and lots of toast. So, oh, convex. Okay, cool. So now we have. Oh, okay. So now we've solved world hunger. <laughs> with toast, yeah, with lots of bread. Shipping all the bread in. And funny enough, you can pause it whilst all these things are happening and basically zoom out and see how all the toast is. So we can, what I can do is I can say, go to this slice of toast, hit F, 
Let's see what it looks like. So now we have... <laughs> we're not removing the toast from the game. It's just kind of falling out of... So this wouldn't be too optimized because it's constantly having to work out where the toast is and all their physics and stuff like this. But what we can do and what we're going to do a bit later on when we have loads of fruit flying through the air is basically remove it after a certain amount of time. So the fruit only lives within the game scene for, for example, a couple of seconds. Then it's destroyed, so it's constantly like not having to calculate the physics of that piece of fruit. It's being removed. So essentially it's bringing it into play and destroys and taking it out of play, for example. Yeah, so we now have a fruit. And what you can do also is if I focus on these, this one, we can then use the stepper at the top to basically go through the steps to see what each frame is going to look like. We now have tumbling through. It's raining toast. It is raining toast, yeah. Which is quite cool. <laughs> yeah, toast, awesome. <laughs> and you've now got tons and tons of toast. Wow. Have you got it spawning upwards? So it's like a toast waterfall. Mm. Okay, cool. Lots and lots of toast. So we've done a couple of sort of really cool basic bits and pieces of Unity. So for example, 3D models, you know, prepping them on the Unity side of things. So for example, picking a collider, uh, assigning materials and textures and things. In Maya, you can just embed the media and you won't have to reassign a texture, for example. Uh, we've got a couple of prefabs, some scripts, some very simple, like the, one of the simplest scripts you could possibly write in Unity is there. Um, what else have we got? We've got like a scene, we've got one or two textures, we've got, we got lots of bits and pieces. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take sort of a lot of this stuff that we've basically laid as groundwork and then build, it on, build upon it to make more of a game which has, basically takes all these things I've shown but kind of to another level. So more of a game environment, and that's the thing that we're going to build to Windows 8 tomorrow. So we'll get it done today, finished. Then if you guys really like homework and really like playing around with things and like want to add your own bits and pieces, you can do. And then tomorrow we're going to come, and then we're going to have the project, and then we're going to build to Windows 8. So you do have a chance to like uh, experiment with it tonight, or drink beer, or whatever you guys are going to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. So we have all these files. So what I want you to do now is something like this. So I want you to create a new folder. Oh, I want you to save. That's important. I learned that lesson. I want you to create a new folder and call this folder Toast Spawner because that's this particular game or this particular interactive thing. And we're going to put into Toast Spawner all the things related to Toast Spawner. So the scripts, um, the textures, yep, the <coughs> textures go into Toast Spawner, sprites don't, scenes we could probably leave out of it, prefabs we can put into Toast Spawner, materials into Toast Spawner, uh, the 3D models into Toast Spawner. So now we have a file called Toast Spawner, which has 3D models, materials, prefabs, because those are all things which have assets which are related to the scene. And we're going to now do sort of a completely different scene. Uh, we're going to create a lot of assets and materials for this. Now, if you're making a, a full game, so I'm going to use uh, Bad Piggies as an example, they wouldn't do something like this. They would probably have a prefabs folder, materials folder, textures folder, and things like that for the whole game. But in this case, as we're sort of segmenting it to two different sort of sections of two sort of games, um, it's going to make more sense in this case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close that down. I'm going to make a new folder. And this one is going to be called Fruit Splat. And inside Fruit Splat is going to go the packages, the fonts, the audio, and that's it. So you should now have Fruit Splat with audio, fonts, packages. <coughs> and you're probably thinking, right, if we're going to make a proper game, why do we only have audio, fonts, and packages? And that's because packages is awesome and I'm going to talk about it in a sec. Cool. So has everyone got that sort of file structure? Oh yeah sure. So it's kind of like all the stuff that was just for Toast Spawner is in there. It just keeps our project neat. I'm a bit of a stickler for that. Sweet. 
So what we're going to do now is we're going to use packages. And I'm going to talk about those for a bit. So inside the audio folder, we've got two types of audio files. Um, I mean, two different audio files. One's fruit splat, and what you can do is, if you can select it, just like we could preview what the 3D model was we'd select or the texture, you can also do it for audio. So, I'm going to hear lots of splats now. Right? Cool, and we should also have a track. I found that on an audio portal somewhere. It's a free Creative Commons thing. <laughs> so we have two we have different, very different uh, bits of sound. We've got one which is more of an event sound, so some form of special effects which is going to be called within the game when a particular event happens. So when uh, a piece of fruit splats, it's then going to go to this audio clip and then play this from that particular location in the scene. So for example, this is going to be a 3D sound. Um, the other one, which is the Temple of Ruth, is what the track's called, that's more of like a 2D sound. That's going to be playing in the background constantly from the particular source on the camera. So you have 2D sound and 3D sound. So 2D sound's more like things that are going to be like an overlay of audio, whereas the 3D sound's more things within the game environment which are based on distance. So if I throw a rock across this room, I wouldn't expect if it hit, I'm not going to throw a rock, so <laughs> um, I wouldn't expect when it hits the wall over there to it sound like I've hit next to me. And with the 3D sound, you can do that. You can create a, a source of audio from a particular location so it actually sounds like an audio point, which is cool. So inside the fonts folder, we've got a very simple font. We can set the font size, it's font names, not particularly interesting. We're going to use that for like some form of score system in the corner to calculate how much fruit we've splatted. Next is packages. So packages is a useful way of, um, if you're not using version control and you're in a scenario like this, where I needed to get all you guys lots of files straight away. Now I could have left all those files completely open, all these files that are going to be inside this package, and then bring it across. I might have accidentally forgot like a texture, in that case we have pink fruit, and so on and so forth. Instead what you can do is you can you create a Unity package. So when you create a package, so for example, I select Toast Spawner. If I click right click the take, 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 Toast Spawner and do Export Package, it's basically include all the dependencies that it has. So if I select objects, so if I selected the prefabs, what it would do is it would get the 3D models it uses, the materials it uses, the scripts it uses, basically includes all the things that it's using in this big package, and it kind of like does a Unity zip. So then I can just give some of the package, and I know everything in there is everything that should be in there, as opposed to anything extra that I don't use, or anything extra that I uh, actually needed to give to you guys. So in this case, what we need to do is I want to go to the fruits package, double click it, so it will decompress the package, and before it imports in, it will show you every single thing that's in there. So you can scroll through and you can see there's no Trojans, no uh, dodgy files. I'm not hacking your machines and stuff. Instead, what you can see is we have a bunch of materials. We've got some models. We've got some textures. We have some prefabs. <coughs> um, and we also have a scene, which is pre-made. So those are all the things. And you can even select each of the models. So for example, in this case, select the prefab see what the textures look like, um, see the normal maps of the textures. Uh, yeah, basically you can see all the materials and all the bits and pieces. And when we're happy with all that, we can tick things. So if I say, I don't want to include fruits, but I do want to include scenes, I can tick off the fruits folder and it would only import the scenes. But in this case, we want to import everything. So if we click import, it will then go through, it will unpackage the package, what you'll notice is it'll bring out all the little files. So in this case, in the scenes folder, we now have fruits flat. And we also have a folder called fruits now. And I want you to drag and drop fruits into the fruits flat folder. So what we should have now is we should have a fruits flat folder, which has fruits in it. Scenes, which has two things, sprites and toast spawner. So it's all neat and tidy, very nice and organized. So let's see what's in fruits flat. <coughs> So if you go into the fruits folder, you'll notice that I've basically added materials, models, prefabs, and textures all pre-made for you, simply for time. So we've got a material, which is basically of a lemon. Um, it's bumped specular, so it's a bit shiny. Um, you can basically preview what this looks like on like cubes and things. 
Uh, this is a material that if we applied it to a cube, it would basically look like that, for example. It'd wrap around it like that. It's got a um, texture, and it's also got a normal map to give it a bit of depth. We've also got a line texture, and we have an orange texture as well. Now, under models, you don't have to worry about this, because I've already done all sort of the heavy lifting. We've got 3D models of lemons, limes, um, and all the textures that sort of go with them. But that's okay. Uh, you can just close models. Prefabs we're going to be using. So inside here, you'll notice I've pre-made, uh, for example, a whole bunch of bits and pieces. So I've got a lemon, there's a mesh renderer, a mesh collider, which is convex, which someone pointed out earlier on about the toast. Um, as an animator, but that's don't need to worry about. Rigid body, and it has all these things. So I've basically got a lemon, a half lemon, which is quite cool, um, a lime, a half lime, an orange, and a half orange. So a collection of fruit, basically. Then if we close that down, we've got textures folder, and inside there we've got a bunch of textures. So the majority of stuff you don't have to worry about. So if you have an artist who's created all your props and all your things for your game, he's probably going to create them all up, mock them up in Unity, add rigid bodies, do all these bits and pieces, do all the colliders. Then he's probably going to package them up and then send it over to you. You unzip the package, and he'll probably say something like, or in my experience, he'll say, oh, these folders are all the models and textures and materials and things. Don't, don't bother poking around with them. Here are the prefabs, the actual stuff, the end final things you want to use. But we still need to use all the model. We still need all the models beforehand because it needs to know what mesh it's using, what texture it's using, and so on and so forth. So we're going to use them. So what you'll notice is that inside a scenes folder, we've got cube spawner. We also have fruit splat. So what I want you to do is I want you to double click fruit splat. It's going to say, "Do you want to save cube spawner?" Yes. And it's going to open up fruit splat. And you won't be able to know much see much difference apart from the fact that our hierarchy's changed. So this scene isn't that obvious that it's changed. It's more of a case of um, it's a different scene but it hasn't got a lot of stuff in it. Obviously if you're making for example a city builder game you'd have like a park scene and perhaps like um, a train station scene. Obviously the 3D models will swap in you'll be able to see which scene you're currently in. Also along the top of the Unity window you can see which scene you're currently in. So we're currently in Fruits Flat because if I went to cube spawner, it would basically change and say you're in cube spawner now. So we are now in fruit spawner. So we've got a couple of things. We have directional light already set up. We've got manager, which has no objects on, but we're going to have to change that soon. And underneath the main camera, what you'll be able to notice is that we have five spawn points. So we have the main camera here, which is positions normally. Um, and if you look at the game view, it's just like slightly darker gray display as opposed to the light blue. And what you'll notice is I've made several children. So these children are all objects which are basically attached to that first object so that it's its parent. So if, for example, I take the camera and I rotate it and so on and so forth, those children are going to move in relation to the camera. So if I had a game where this moved back and left and right, those children are all going to move in relation to it. They're, all their positions and rotation scales are local to their parent. Cool, but I'm going to position it where it was. What you'll notice, these five spawn points, so like I was raving about them beforehand, are all just empty game objects. And they're all slightly rotated. So what you'll notice is that if I select the far left one, it's rotated slightly an angle of that. If I notice this one, it's slightly angled. This one's straight up. This one's at an angle. This one's an angle. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it similar to Fruit Ninja, where basically it fires fruit at these particular angles, and they're going to collide in midair. And you've got to like tap, for example, only the lemons to get points. Whereas the other ones are going to come into play, you may do a thing where if you click a lemon, you get 10 points. If you click an orange, you get minus 20 points. It depends if you like fruit or not, or what types of fruit you're into. Um, so with these empty game objects, one problem that a lot of people have is the fact that you can't see the empty game objects if you've not selected them. So let's okay, let's go back to Cube Spawner. Uh, this is just a little quick example. So we have our empty spawn point, which is hovering somewhere above our platform. Now, I don't know where it is. I mean, I have a little icon for the camera. I have a little icon for the light. But I have an empty game object somewhere up here. If I select it, I actually know, OK, it's actually here. The gizmo is in the middle of where it is. I now know it's at this particular location. But that not, might not be <coughs> useful if I have 20 of these, and I need to know exactly where they are and display them. I don't want to add a mesh render to them, because the camera's got to render that. So one thing you can do in the Unity uh, editor is basically add like a little label, which is basically only drawn in the scene. You can see where it is in the scene. So to do that, 
Okay, this has been in Unity for ages, but I didn't know about this till recently, which is quite, it's not documented anywhere, which is really bizarre, is this little box here is actually a button, and if you click that, you can actually pick a particular label. I think that should be way more obvious, um, but I don't know. So if I click, for example, the blue label, what you'll notice is that if I select off of the empty game object, it's going to show a label at the particular location of that point. Similarly, if I give it like a little dark blue point, I can then set up like a um, individual point for each, you know, each spawn point that it's going to happen uh, and spawn things. And what you can also do is you can go to other and basically pick something from your list. So I can basically say have the Unity logo as like an icon, so at this particular location. So yeah, this is basically a way of if I go to the game view, you can't see the empty spawn point, but in the scene view it does. So it's kind of like a way of making it show and making it visible where things will spawn. So if I go to Fruit Splat, I've basically done that already for you. So for example, um, I've got five empty spawn points. I mean, I could have gone through them and set, you know, square points, but I just wanted to show you that it basically doms the name of that particular game object. So for example, here, spawn point one, adds a label spawn point one onto it. It's all very standard. So that's cool. We can actually see where our objects are spawning. And they're going to spawn just beneath the camera as well. So what you'll notice is if the camera's perspective is like this, basically all these empty game objects are kind of going to spawn just beneath where the peripheral vision is. So they're all going to spawn just beneath and then fling themselves upwards into the position of the camera. Wicked. So let's do that. So what we need to do now is in the Fruit Splat folder, we're going to create a new folder called Scripts. And then inside that folder of Scripts, what we're going to do is... Um, we're going to make a new C-sharp script, and this C-sharp script is going to be called Fruit Spawner. Actually, Fruit Spawner Manager, because otherwise I'm calling an object Fruit Spawner. Yeah, just call it Fruit Spawner Manager, because it's going to manage all of the objects. It's going to pick where it spawns from each time it rolls through. So now if you double-click Fruit Spawner Manager, what you'll be able to do is write a particular script for this particular thing. So one thing we're going to do is we're going to attach this to the manager because the manager in the end is going to be the thing that holds this important script that's going to be doing this important thing. So inside here we're going to write a couple of things. So the first thing that we need to write is... First thing we're going to write is we're going to write an array to hold all of our fruits. So fruits array. Then we're going to write an array that's going to hold all of our spawn points. So in this case... Uh, spawn point array. The next thing that we're going to do is probably float. We're going to write a float, so a variable with that you, you guys know what float is. And this is going to be spawn delay. So we've got three things in. Our basically stored list of fruit, our stored list of the array points, and we're going to spawn delay. This is basically so that we don't have a toast situation and spawn millions of fruit at the start of run time. Even though that'd be quite fun, it would be quite difficult for the player to play the game, crash devices, that's not good. We want to have some form of delay between each object being spawned to give a chance for our player to actually do well in the game. There's another thing that I want to do, and this one, oh, okay, actually, save it for a different script. So what we want to do now is we now want to do a loop. So this is basically going to run every so often, and it's going to say, when it gets this point, run the loop. When it gets this point, run the loop. And basically, that loop is going to include pick a, pick a fruit, pick a spawn point, fire it up, delay, then go back. Pick a fruit, pick a spawn point, fire it up, then delay. Pick a fruit, pick a spawn point, da 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 da, da. It's going to run the loop. Now, I don't like to do these inside update, because update runs every frame, and you can't really say to update, Okay, run every frame, now wait for seven frames or seven seconds, then carry on running frames. Update's kind of like a steam train, it kind of like just plows on through no matter what you tell it to do. So I'm going to get rid of update, not use that. And instead, in start, so when the scene happens, I'm going to invoke a function. So this function is going to be called spawn fruit, and I'm going to invoke it after a certain amount of time. So invoke basically says go and run this function after 0.5 seconds. So that way it doesn't begin and then suddenly loads of fruit are firing. It gives a chance to the player, you know, to see the game, assess what they're doing with the game, 
how it works, perhaps have some form of intro music, basically a little delay at the start. We can always toy around this later on. Cool. Wicked. So what we're going to do now is we're invoking spawn fruit after 0.5 seconds. So then we need to basically create our method of spawn fruit and then say, I'm just going to code comment in, uh, do the spawning and firing of the fruit. Awesome. Then at the bottom invoke fruit, what we're going to do is we're going to invoke fruit again, but with a particular delay. So it's like I said earlier, it's like different ways to cut the quiche. There's lots of different ways to do a loop like this. So some people do do it in the update, and they basically trick it and say, oh, the update's there for a reason. It runs every frame. I prefer this way. Other people have other ways of doing it. This is kind of like the simplest way that you can do it, and you can sort of embellish on it later. But instead, what we're going to do now is we call this front method. It's going to do the spawning. Then after it runs that loop, we're going to write invoke the same function again. But instead of 0.5 seconds, we're going to use spawn delay. So the start, it's a defined time, and then we're going to use spawn delay. And we're going to randomize that every time. So at the start, we're going to say, OK, every 0.2 seconds spawn a fruit. But then eventually, we're going to say, right, pick a number between 0.1 seconds and 0.5 seconds, and then use that as the delay. So it's kind of like fruit comes out in clumps as opposed to like a defined structure. And it's going to be quite obvious when they're going to arrive. Awesome. So what we're going to do now is we're going to write a debug message. So we're going to write debug.log, uh, fruit has been spawned. So what debug.log is, is it's Unity's way of outputting a message to the editor or the console to display a particular bit of information. So this isn't being displayed to the user. This is kind of like being printed in the background um, without the user sort of realizing it. It's mainly for just, like it says, debugging in editor to see perhaps how far a player is from a particular trigger point to trigger an event, or how many audio clips are currently running in your scenes. You don't want to run too many because they'll overlap with each other. So if we then go back into the Unity editor, we take Fruit Spawn Manager and attach it to the manager. So what we should do is we should now have a script. We should have a slot for a couple of fruit, a slot for a spawn point array, spawn delay. If we set that spawn delay to be, I don't know, 0.3, what we can do now is basically test that. So in the window at the bottom, there's a little console. So inside the console, like it showed the error messages earlier on, this is basically going to show everything that we push out a debug.log to. So what should happen is we should invoke after 0.5 seconds, spawns the fruit, delays it, spawns the fruit, and so on and so forth at a pace of 0.3 seconds. Um, I just dragged and dropped it like that. So what you should notice now is under the console when you run the game, there should be a little bit of a delay at the start. Then fruit's been spawned. You can see the rate that it's basically spawning it at. Cool. It's basically that that message is being triggered every single time a piece of fruit's been spawned. It's quite useful to output messages and things like that. Um, to basically see at what point the thing is happening. So now that we know that our loop works and it's happening, now we can do all the fun stuff. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to pick a random piece of fruit. So we're going to go int random fruit int equals random dot range. And what would the maximum value be? If anyone can remember. The maximum value for the random range. Fruits array dot length because what if we you know made ten more fruits for example so int random fruit int equals this we're then also going to go int random spawn point int or ran random spawn point dot range spawn point array dot length so every time this loops around we're going to pick a random number to assign to the array of the fruit and pick a random spawn point as well. So it's not going to be the same game. We're not going to have a rigid structure. Some games do do that. So like Jetpack Joyride does have a set, like the, the first 
Things like something like the first ten or so waves in Jetpack Joyride are like the same or something like that, or like the first five. Then they start randomizing it to ease the player in. So collect some coins, collect some coins, dodge a couple of lasers, then it goes random. So they'd write something in to say if it's within the first five waves, do set order, then start randomly picking them or something like this. But in this case, we're going to pick a random fruit each time because that's the type of game we're making. Cool. So now that we have picked these numbers, we can then use these values. So we're going to go game object created fruit because we want to be able to do something with the fruit after it's created. I'm just going to tab it onto a new line simply because so you guys can see. And now we're going to write a pretty long instantiate. So we're going to write fruits array. Which fruit are we going to use in? Random fruit in. Um, spawn point array. Uh, random spawn point in dot position okay I'll stick this all on lines and stuff uh, spawn point array random spawn point in dot rotation because we want to take the, we want to basically spawn the object with the same rotation as the spawn point. Because otherwise, all they're going to do is they're just going to fire up in the air, and it's going to be boring. We want them to kind of like take what the spawn point's rotation is. So in this case, slightly towards each other, and fire them towards each other so they clash in midair. Then we're going to write at the end of that as game object because we need to tell it what we're instantiating it as. So yeah, that line looks very sort of long, but it does make sense. Basically, just saying, pick an object from this list, pick a spawn point from this list, pick a spawn point. Now, we could probably compress that down and basically say, before we do all this picking, already pick, like, already set up like a game object and cache, like, which one we're going to be using, or cache the position that we're going to be using earlier on. But uh, it works both ways. This is fine for the moment. Awesome. So we're going to do another trick in a second, but we want to make sure that that works first. So once that's done, uh, go back into Unity, and then we're going to do some dragging and dropping, which is cool. So it's like five past two now, and I think there's coffee break. Right. Now, um, We'll drag and drop the objects in, and then we'll have fruit dropping. Um, so we're going to do one little thing, and then everyone's going to get coffee, and I'm going to get coffee for sure, uh, yeah, <laughs> and things like that. And then basically, where the fruit's going to be dropping for random points, then we're going to apply forces to the fruit. So instead of them dropping or having to turn, determine tangent, we're basically going to apply force in the direction, and then let physics take its way and let them clash in midair, and then click them and splat them and stuff. And it's going to be fun. Cool. So has everyone got that sort of mega line of code down? Sort of mega. Cool. So I'm now going to assign the things in the scene. So if I go to my manager, what you notice is we have two lists. So the amount of fruit that we have, uh, so we have six items of fruit. I was going to slip some toast in there, but I think we've overdone it on the toast. Um, so I'm going to change the array of fruits to six, and then there's a couple of ways that you can do this. You can drag and drop them in individually. That can take time and so on and so forth. Another thing that you can do, and here's a neat little trick, is if I select, for example, the fruit, so say like I try and select multiple fruits, basically the inspector has now targeted those fruits as opposed to the manager. So what we want to do is we want to lock the man this inspector to always be on the manager so we can then select a load of objects and drag and drop them in. So one way they can do this is select a particular object. And you'll notice there's a little padlock at the top. So the little padlock at the top basically says, well, currently it's unlocked. If you click it, it basically locks it. Now, if I go off and select a different object, the camera, the manager's always going to be selected in the inspector, so it's always going to be visible there. So if I then take, for example, the fruit array down to, uh, let's say the zero items, I can then select all these objects within here, drag and drop them into the fruit array, and basically it's populated the array like so. And I can do the same thing with spawn points. I can then drag and drop all the spawn points, 
like so. Unlock the manager so that it's now free and we can now start doing bits and pieces. And what you can notice now is we now have falling fruit. It's randomly picking the spawn point each time, randomly picking a bit of fruit. In a bit, we'll have them firing, have them spinning in midair. So we kick, we, as well as adding a force, we're going to add a little torque, so it kicks it round, so it does like a little spin, as opposed to uniform flying. <coughs> oh um, no, it's just they're, they're just hard models. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have time to write some code that you splat them and then they split.